Greetings, motherfuckers! Hello, hello, my guy. Hello, how are you? 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 Ha! Just kidding. I'm Sam, and that was Simlish. But why? Why was that Simlish? Well, that's because today we're here to talk about one of the biggest video game franchises of all time, like ever. Yes, it's that wish fulfillment simulator, The Sims. It's been a big part of our millennial little lives, so hey, let's deep dive right into it like a pool with no ladders to get out with. But what's the hidden conspiracy at the center of The Sims? How were guinea pigs responsible for a Sim massacre? And where can I buy that vibrating heart bed in real life? Not for woohoo or anything, it just looks like it'd be great for my back. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so fill your aspiration meter, type in Rosebud, keep pressing enter, and watch the money roll in, baby. I don't know what I'm doing. As we go through 101 facts about The Sims. Galigula. Number one. The Sims is a series of highly entertaining life simulation video games developed by Maxis and published by Electronic Arts. Most of the games in the Sims series are sandbox games. That doesn't mean they're set in a sandpit, silly. It means they lack any defined goals, and the player creates virtual people called Sims who are then placed in houses, which players can either construct themselves or choose from a number of pre-constructed homes. Number two. Players of the games then direct their Sims by controlling their behavior and choosing how to satisfy their needs and desires. Sims do possess some degree of free will and will move and engage in certain activities by themselves when left alone, but they are ultimately under the control of the player. Much like we are, makes you think, huh? Number three. The Sims series was created by American video game designer Will Wright, who not only has the name of a supervillain, but also co-founded the former game development company Maxis, and first rose to prominence after creating the 1989 video game Sim City. Number 4. Wright was inspired to create The Sims as a virtual dollhouse in the aftermath of the Oakland Firestorm in 1991, in which his house burned down and all his possessions were destroyed. Weird inspo, but sure. Wright was forced to replace everything he had lost, and in the months that followed, he began to ponder the possibility of a game that had players create a life from scratch, requiring a new house and completely new household items, ranging from socks to furniture. Number 5. Wright's earliest conceptions of what would eventually become The Sims were significantly different to the game we all know and love today. Indeed, the game was originally going to be an architecture simulator that allowed players the ability to build houses, while The Sims were added to simply interact with and respond to the various objects created for the game. It would have just been build mode, but forever. Number 6. However, it quickly became obvious that The Sims were one of the more interesting aspects of the game, and the direction was changed to make these characters the focus of the project. What a crazy idea, I bet that would never work. Number 7. Wright's first prototype of The Sims was created in 1993, seven years before the first game was eventually released. Initially, it involved a single Sim navigating their environment and interacting with objects. This was an important step to producing a workable game, and in the subsequent months, Wright became convinced of the project's viability. Huh. Number 8. Nevertheless, when Wright initially took his ideas to the Maxis board of directors, his early plans for The Sims were met with skepticism and drew little support or financing. So Wright gave up and The Sims never got made. Good night. Number 9. <coughs> oh. Oh. Psych! Maxis was bought by Electronic Arts in 1997, and the new powers that be who replaced the old powers that be were far more receptive to Wright's idea. SimCity, after all, had been a great success, and the possibility of creating a strong franchise out of the Sim games was clearly a tantalizing prospect. And money. Yummy, yummy money. Number 10. Wright had commented that he initially envisioned The Sims as a satire of US consumer culture, noting how people became so obsessed with the acquisition of more and more expensive things. So apparently I'm meant to feel bad while playing The Sims? Great, thanks Obama. Number 11. Wright has also stated that while designing The Sims, he took inspo from three main sources. The first of which was the 1977 architecture and urban design book, A Pattern Language which to this day remains one of the best-selling books on architecture. Wow, what a cultural fella. One intelligence point for him. Number 12. Wright's second source of Simspiration <laughs> get it? was a theory of human motivation, a highly influential 1943 paper written by the American psychologist Abraham Maslow. In his paper, Maslow conceived of a hierarchy of needs, which is traditionally represented as a pyramid with a person's most fundamental physiological requirements at the base, beneath safety, love, and esteem, with self-actualization at the apex. The Sims ain't dumb, yo. Number 13. 
The third source was Charles Hampton Turner's 1982 book Maps of the Mind, which compares numerous influential theories on how the mind works. Red used these three works to develop a model for the game's artificial intelligence and how players would succeed by providing for their sims. Number 14. However, these highfalutin academic works weren't the only things that influenced The Sims. When initially designing the game, Wright spent considerable time researching the fan community of the highly successful Quake games, within which players invested impressive amounts of time and effort constructing their own custom levels. This in turn fueled Wright's aim to make The Sims as customizable as possible. Number 15. You might be somewhat surprised to know that the first object ever implemented into The Sims was in fact the humble toilette. This is because of its versatility as a single object that offers many different potential interactions and possible variables, giving The Sims the option to use the toilet either standing up or sitting down, as well as the ability to flush and clean it. Sims were even given the option to leave the seat up or down. It really was revolutionary. Number 16. Wright has stated that throughout the design process, the game's user interface was redesigned from scratch a total of 11 times. 11. That's a lot of clicking and designing. Number 17, oh yeah, yeah. Getting people to understand how directing a bunch of individuals in fairly ordinary and regular activities could be a fun video game was a challenge in and of itself. In fact, The Sims came across as so mundane to early tester groups that Wright had feared the game would never happen. Oh, I wonder what's gonna happen next. Number 18. Eventually, all of Wright's hard work paid off, and it wasn't mundane, hooray! In February of the year 2000, Electronic Arts released The Sims, the very first video game in The Sims franchise and its base title for Microsoft Windows. And lo, the world did rejoice, for unto them had been given one of the most addictive video games of all creation, and they looked upon it and saw that it was good. I am available for voice work. Number 19. The first Sims game was supplemented by no less than seven expansion packs and two deluxe editions with exclusive content. Together, these titles represent the first generation of the series on the PC. I just also wanted to say that this included the ingenious item of teleporters instead of stairs that I desperately want someone to invent in real life. It's hard on the knees. Number 20. Wright had originally wanted to call the game Dollhouse, believing that his game was essentially a high-tech customizable video game version of the traditional Dollhouse, so the apt name was apt. Apt, I tell you. However, the name was predictably scrapped, because you can't sell a video game called Dollhouse to young males, especially one with virtually no gun violence. Damn you, patriarchy. Number 21. One of the game's most recognizable features is the massive crystal that levitates ominously above your selected sim, which has itself become a symbol of the Sims series in general. However, even some of the most seasoned Sims players don't actually know the name of this curious hovering gem, which is in fact known as a plumb bob. Good to know. Number 22. Ooh, yeah, me, oh, oh, yeah. The currency used in the world of Sims is the Simoleon, a word that, believe it or not, actually existed already before the Sims. It derives from Simon's, an 18th century British slang for sixpence. Number 23. Simoleons are represented in the game by the section symbol, a typographical glyph used to reference individual numbered sections of text, most commonly in legal documents, so they didn't even create their own currency symbol. Lazy. Number 24. When designing the game, Wright feared that were the Sims to speak existing languages, hearing them say the same phrases over and over again would quickly become repetitive and robotic. In addition, he was also not exactly thrilled with the prospect of translating and marketing the game in several different languages upon its worldwide distribution. Number 95. Wright even toyed with the idea of having Sims speak rare languages like Navajo and Estonian, but felt that even non-speakers would be able to identify common phrases over time. Damn, Sims were almost speaking Navajo. Number 26. In order to avoid these results, Wright decided that a unique fictional language made up mostly by garbled yet very endearing gibberish would work best for The Sims. The result was Simlish, the official language of The Sims, which allows players to discern a Sims' feelings and emotional state based on their tone and tempo, without the pesky repetitive sound of dialogue formed using real languages. Number 27. Curiously, it's been stated by numerous sources that Simlish does actually draw from various real-life languages, including Ukrainian, French, Latin, Finnish, English, Fijian, Cebuano, and Tagalog, although this has not been confirmed. It just sounds like Swedish to me. Number 28. There is a pinball machine available to buy in The Sims called the See Me Feel Me Pinball Machine, the description of which ends with By Who? By Tomiko, of course. This is a sly reference to the song See Me Feel Me, a song by the celebrated British rock band The Who from their 1969 album Tommy. Number 29. 
The non-playable character Mortimer Goth, the patriarch of the Goth family, is likely based on the iconic American horror actor Vincent Price. Mortimer's appearance in The Sims is proof you can fit a Vincent Price reference into anything, and sometimes you should. Number 30. In order to launch The Sims in China, the team behind The Sims were forced to remove the criminal career option. Which was always weird anyway, because how could you find that in a paper anyway? Which the Chinese authorities felt didn't send the right message to their younger citizens. As a result, in Chinese versions of the game, the criminal career track is replaced with the possibility to pursue a career as mime. Because if you're not a criminal, you're a mime. Number 31. If you click on the Mactus symbol on the autoplay window that appears when The Sims is loading, you'll be shown a cartoon image of the game's creator, Will Wright, riding a scooter with a number of tiny people, presumably Sims I guess, climbing on his arms, shoulders and head. Or it's a disturbing crossover into the borrowers as well. The borrowers scare me. They're scary. Number 32. As we all know, The Sims quickly became a huge success. Otherwise, why would we be doing a video on it, eh? By the 22nd of March 2002, The Sims had sold more than 6.3 million copies worldwide. And by February 2005, the game had shipped a staggering 16 million copies worldwide. Number 33. The success of the game was such that it eventually surpassed the 1993 graphic adventure puzzle video game Myst to become the best-selling PC video game in history. A record it held until it was eclipsed by its success of The Sims 2, but let's not spoil that bit yet. Number 34. Speaking of landmarks, The Sims was the first video game to appear on the cover of Newsweek. We'll get there soon, one on one facts team, and you mother factors, someday. Number 35. The Sims was featured in the first and third episodes of the fourth season of the American drama TV series Six Feet Under, in which the game was played by the character of Arthur, who is in turn played by Dwight himself, Rain Wilson, who is in turn being played as a Sim by a 12-year-old boy called Duncan, and he's being played by an 80-year-old called Janet. And so the cycle continues on. Number 36. On the 27th of August 2000, several months after the release of The Sims, the game was given its very first expansion pack in the form of The Sims Live in Large. However, you may know it by a slightly different name, because in the UK, Ireland, and Portugal, it was for some reason changed to The Sims Living It Up. No idea why. Number 37. One of the most bizarre and intriguing mysteries from the world of The Sims has to do with a particular virus introduced into the game with the Live and Large expansion, which caused many Sims to fall ill, seemingly without explanation. The mystifying plague caused Sims to sneeze and cough frequently, and without appropriate rest, the sickness could be fatal. Number 38. Eventually, players figured out the cause of the illness. It was, in fact, guinea pigs. Okay. Specifically, the Sims were getting sick after being bitten by the pet guinea pigs that were introduced in Live in Large. And even more specifically, it was by those living in dirty cages that had not been cleaned by their lazy Sim owners. So they had it coming, is what I'm saying. Number 39. Naturally, the inclusion of the guinea pig illness irritated huge numbers of Sims players, who bombarded Maxis with angry messages about their beloved Sims who died at the hands of an inscrutable disease that had never been announced by the game's creators. In response, Max has eventually updated the game so that Sims could only contract a mild illness from their neglected guinea pigs, rather than the life-threatening condition that developed before the update. Maybe you guys should just look after your virtual pets before you start blaming others for your bad luck, okay? Just saying. Number 40. On the 2nd of April 2001, the House Party expansion pack was released, which allowed you to put on the hippest, most happening soiree in all the party history. Indeed, if your Sims threw a cool enough party, they could be honoured by a surprise appearance from the one and only Drew Carey, who will arrive in a limo to congratulate you and hang the fudge out. Number 41. Drew Carey is in fact a fan of The Sims himself and even parodied them in an episode of his creatively titled sitcom, The Drew Carey Show. The meaning of life. <coughs> God. On the 28th of March 2002, the Vacation Expansion Pack was released, in which you were able to take your sims on a much needed break from guinea pig disease and being tormented by a malevolent creator who forces them into large swimming pools and then removes the stairs. You know who you are. Like Live and Large, Vacation also got renamed outside the US, and in the UK, Ireland, Portugal and China, the game was known as The Sims on Holiday. Number 43. Released on the 28th of March 2002, the game's fifth expansion back, titled The Sims Unleashed, contains Zydeco music that was written and performed by the Zydeco Flames, a real-life Zydeco band. What is Zydeco music, I hear you ask? Frankly, it's better you don't know. Number 44. After supplementing the first Sims game with extra content for three years, Electronic Arts released The Sims 2 on the 14th of September 2004. Hilariously, in some countries where this was the first Sims game released, The Sims 2 was just called The Sims, which is bafflingly confusing. Number 45. 
Here's something weird. The Sims games actually kind of have a narrative. For instance, even though it was released only four real life years after The Sims 1, The Sims 2 is set some 25 years after the original. Number 46. If you didn't realize this, then frankly, you haven't been paying attention. The goth family from the first game, who are, you know, a bit gothy, have aged quite significantly. And Bella actually mysteriously disappeared at one point during the break. Yeah, <laughs> get on that all time conspiracies. Number 47. Strangely though, the disappearance of Bella Goth is actually quite a big in-universe mystery. There are several books in The Sims 3 that reference Bella's disappearance, leading to some Inspector Morse types to determine she was kidnapped or even murdered. Either that or she was abducted by aliens and taken to Strange Town. Heavy stuff for a game about controlling an AI family. Number 48. The difference in visuals between the sequel and its predecessor is quite obvious, but I'll let you know the specifics anyway. The Sims 2 takes place in a fully 3D environment with fully 3D sprites. This is in contrast to the first one, which instead had 2D and dimetric projection. Hell yeah, long words. Number 49. Now that's all very well and good and nice and good and great and nice and good. However, it caused some major headaches for Sims fans. Because of this evolution from 2 to 3D, it meant The Sims 2 had to be recreated from a scorched Sims Earth. It also meant that any content from the first generation would not be able to be used in the game at all. But objects and features from the original were remade for the sequel. So that's nice, but only some of them. Less nice. Number 50. In The Sims 2, Sims age through seven life stages, from infancy to old age to death, within which they can hope to get to the next one before wishing they truly enjoyed the earlier ones instead and have a horrible crisis about it. Sorry, I'm going through a few things. As well as this, there are days of the week too, complete with weekends. Yeah, The Sims 2 took it up a level. Number 51. Another step The Sims 2 took to make The Sims similar to real life peeps was to give them an aspiration system. Now this means they have needs and meters according to what they want in life, which can be filled by completing certain tasks, which can then purchase aspiration awards, you know, just like in real life. Number 52. Aspirations in the base game include grow up, although that's exclusively for children, family, fortune, knowledge, popularity, and romance. There was, however, an aspiration called power. It's actually still in the game, it's just unfinished. It's a combination of popularity and fortune, and it's now only available through cheating, which, weirdly, is also like power in real life. <laughs> Number 53. EA kind of went crazy with additional content for The Sims 2. There were eight expansion packs, University, Nightlife, Open for Business, Pets, Seasons, Bon Voyage, Free Time, and Apartment Life. There were also nine stuff packs, and over 400 individual items were released via The Sims 2 store. Number 54. Here's the thing though, many features introduced in the expansion packs, like weather from seasons and driving cars in nightlife, were going to be in the base game. However, a big old fire in the server room at Maxis ruined that, as the data for these games was then lost. Number 55. That being said though, rain seemed to be a problem from the get-go. Rendering errors kept making it rain indoors, and not in a cool strip club way either, so they just left it to an expansion pack later down the line. Number 56. To be as extra realistic as possible, the developers of the game somehow got real musical artists to re-record their songs in Simlish. For the second instalment, this includes artists like Depeche Mode, Lily Allen and the Pussycat Dolls. But for later games, even Katy Perry got in on the act. Yeah, it's, it's weird. <laughs> Number 57. The music track Arch of the Sims from the Sims 2 University Expansion Pack may sound familiar to some of you. That's because, for, uh, some reason, in 2012 it was used as the soundtrack to the season 4 gag reel for Breaking Bad. Again, I have no idea why that happened either. I'll bang whoever I want to bang. Number 58. Marketing for The Sims 2 took a bit of a weird turn in the Netherlands. For four days, actors lived in an apartment with glass walls as the Sturken Booms. They could be viewed via a website as well as through glass walls, and would be in character the whole time, taking suggestions about what to do from email. This was before the internet became a troll pool, so luckily the suggestions weren't that bad. Number 59. In The Sims 2, there's a village called Veronaville. Now try to remember your high school learnings here. What's that a reference to, hey? Hmm? Yes, that's right, it's Romeo and Juliet. Its title refers to Verona, where the play is set, and all of its residents and their relationships are similar to the play too, with the Caps and the Montes instead of Capulets and Montagues. Number 60. The creator of The Sims, Will Wright, appears a couple of times within the game itself like the big head he is. I say that because one of those appearances is literally a big head. In Strange Town, you can see a giant rock shaped like his head. As well as this, in the University Expansion Pack, students with over 8 logic can get the Will Wright Genius Grant for teens. <laughs> what a nice guy. Number 61. 
Safe to say that The Sims 2 was sure heckin' popular. In fact, in its first 10 days, it sold over 1 million copies, a record at the time. Number 62. One expansion pack called The Sims 2 colon pets was basically The Sims 2, but with pets like dogs and cats and stuff. If you've ever thought they sound a bit, well, weird, it's because the developers didn't use real animal sounds, but humans performing them. Yeah, think about that, they're not so cute now, huh? Number 63. Speaking of which, The Sims 2 colon pet is the most successful expansion pack ever, selling well over 6 million copies. Nintendo 64. The Sims 2 also made it to the Game Boy Advance, like all great things did. Hooray. The Strange Town Zoo in this game has a portrait of Lloyd from the spin-off The Herb Sims in the City, on the wall near its entrance. Oh yes, there was also a spin-off called The Herb Sims in the City. It wasn't really like The Sims, it was this weird, like, RPG. It was strange. Number 65. If you thought your Sims looked too human, the Game Boy Advance version of the game had you covered. Well, okay, nearly. That's because the game had unused red and green skin tones for that intergalactic feel. Number 66. Do with this information what you will, but the Game Boy Advance version also had an unused minigame called Yeti Loves Cake. I have no idea what it is, and frankly, I don't want to know either. Number 67. The Game Boy Advance version of the game had an unused cutscene of Dusty Hog riding his motorcycle to jump over a shark pool. I have no idea why they cut it, but it's a reference to the phrase jumping the shark, which means when a fictional property has run out of ideas. Wow, at The Sims 2 as well. Number 68. The strange thing about The Sims is that it's unbelievably successful, but weirdly it has no to very little in the way of clones or competitors. Will Wright himself has said that disappointed him, as he thought it would grow the genre. So, make Will happy and get copying, people. Number 69. Flirt. Heartbed. Woo woo. In 2009, on the 2nd of June to be exact, came The Sims 3. Weirdly somehow, the game is set 25 years before the first Sims. I'm not sure how this affects gameplay, but if you're into The Sims universe lore, you're welcome. Number 70. The Sims 3 had a whole litany of new features, including improved sim creation tools, better building tools, and oodles more wishes and goals. There were also opportunities that the player could accept or deny on behalf of the sim, which is nice, because we all love free will, right? Number 71. People seem to like these features too. At the time, it was the largest release in the history of the PC, with 1.4 million copies sold within the first week. Rosebud, baby. Number 72. Much like other versions of the game because companies love money, 11 expansion packs and 9 stuff packs were released for The Sims 3. To grab even more of that money money money, many individual items were available at The Sims 3 store, again, for real mo mo mo. Number 73. Some easter eggs are wholesome, but some are just outrageously rude. Here's one of the latter. In the DLC expansion pack, Roaring Heights, the school has some frankly awful language on it. That is, if you mirror the text on the entrance. I can't say what it nearly says here for obvious reasons, but it, it made me clutch my pearls, that's for sure. Number 74. There's also an expansion pack called Into the Future, which is weird given The Sims 3 is a prequel, but anyway. In it, there's a pre-made household called the formerly The Plains Express household, with characters within it called Friderick Rama, Lila Turney, and a plum bot named Bendo. This is a reference to the show Futurama, specifically Planet Express, Fry, Leela, and Bender. No Zoidberg, though. Number 75. Private investigator sims will sometimes mention the case of Bella Goth, the sim at the center of a massive conspiracy in which she disappeared, which we mentioned earlier, remember? Thing is though, this is a plot hole, because it's meant to be way before the sims, which is before she disappeared. Confused? Yeah, me too. Number 76. If you like your references, you, uh, referees? Is that what fans of references are called? Here's another one. When using the Time Machine and the Ambitions expansion, your sim appears in a crowd, who were all going on about how some shepherd saved the galaxy from a huge ancient god machine threat. This here is a reference to Little Bo Peep. No, wait, sorry, no, it isn't. It's a reference to the Mass Effect series. Number 77. Also in this expansion pack is a beard for boys that looks similar to that of Seneca Crane, that weird guy from the first Hunger Games film, which is in the future, I guess? Number 78. Some lovely native marketing is hiding within The Sims 3. If The Sims choose to play a video game, like a bloody nerd, because who does that? The Sim will see clips on the TV from other EA games, namely Madden NFL 10, Burnout Paradise, and Skate. Number 79. Pets came back again in another expansion pack for The Sims 3, but this time with a realistic twist, baby. Yes, this time the animal noises were a mix of real animals and creepily humans as well. 
The humans were added, by the way, to help convey emotion a bit better, but still, it's weird. Number 80. The Tardisian Well Sonic Shower is a reference to the TV series Doctor Who in two, count them, two ways. The Doctor's time machine is called the TARDIS, and the Doctors tend to use a sonic screwdriver. Number 81. Speaking of time machines, there is a time portal in the game, because remember, it's a simulation of real life, which is called the Wellsian Time Portal. This is a reference to H.G. Wells' sci-fi novel, The Time Machine. Number 82. In the Into the Future expansion pack, should you stumble upon the dystopian future, a fish with three eyes can be found in the waters there. This is a clear reference to Blinky the Three-Eyed Fish from the... Simpsons? Simpsons? Simpsons. Never heard of it. Number 83. After The Sims 3 came, of course, The Sims f the, the Sims Medieval. This was not an expansion pack for The Sims 3, but rather its own standalone woman that don't need no man. Medieval actually had a few new features and wasn't just a redesign of the environment. It had armed combat and the spiciest of all topics, religion. Number 84. Then though, after The Sims Medieval came The Sims The Dark Ages. Ha, <laughs> lol, just kidding, as the kids say, it's The Sims 4. The Sims 4 was announced back in 2013 and came out in 2014. Lovely stuff. Number 85. If you thought The Sims game having a timeline was weird, then think about this. There's a multiverse. That's because apparently The Sims 4 takes place in an alternate universe to the rest of The Sims games. Not sure why, but these things happen, I suppose. Number 86. As you'd expect, a whole bunch of new stuff that uh, wasn't as exciting as armed combat or religion was added to The Sims 4. In fact, as of April 2019, six expansion packs, seven game packs, and 14 snuff packs have been released. There's also new updates that include new careers, basements, ghosts, pools, toddlers, and terrain tools. Six things that should never, ever go together. Number 87. Predictably, The Sims 4 is more stuff than Anissa Bunny's sack. Don't. With Easter eggs. For instance, there's a poster of Henry Pufter, an obvious allegory for Harry Potter, the Schmapple kitchen appliances that sound very similar to Apple, and perhaps most stupid of all, there's a gnome called the Guardian of the Gnomalaxy. I mean, they didn't even try with that one. Number 88. When doing some business in the business career, you could stumble upon another cheeky ref. While at work, you may be told that someone has encased your stapler in jello as a prank, just like Jim did to Dwight that one time in the US office. There's no option to fire a gun in the workplace, though. <laughs> Number 89. If a sim gets up the digital duff, that's sort of British for pregnant, by the way, the player can influence what gender the baby will be. If the pregnant sim eats strawberries and listens to pop music on the radio, it's more likely to be a girl. The same is true for carrots and alternative music for boys. Because remember, the game is exactly like real life. Number 90. Weirdly, you can enter a tree in this game, and no, don't worry Groot, it's not you. If a sim interacts with the tree at the Crick Cabana in Willow Creek, you can admire the tree, then talk to the tree, then enter a secret area called the Sylvan Glades, where there are rare plants and fish. Lovely. Number 91. In a frankly tingling bout of Simception, within The Sims 4 there's a game called Sims Forever, which shows footage from the first Sims game. Makes you think, doesn't it? I mean, what if you're a sim being told to play The Sims by telling The Sim in The Sims to play The Sim and Unbroken? Number 92. One of The Sims 4's expansion packs, Cats and Dogs, actually had a nice milestone in it. It was the first one to include a pre-made same-sex couple living in its bundled world. Lovely stuff. Number 93. Some YouTubers really, really love playing The Sims, and their loyalty was rewarded in the trailers for The Sims 4 Get Famous. The Sims Supply, Delagracy, X Mira Mira, Claire Siobhan, and Joey Graceffa all appear in various trailers for this pack. Maybe one day we'll appear in a promo. No, not even a simulated version of us could sell anything. Oh. Number 94. There was going to be a spin-off called Simsville, based heavily around The Sims, allowing you to control lots of different houses at once because it wasn't stressful enough already. Maxis cancelled this though, as they wanted more staff to work on the main series. Sad times. Number 95. They didn't just delete every old thing for Simsville, though. The communal downtown area that appears in The Sims Hot Date was originally from Simsville, for instance. The Sims 2 also used 3D neighborhoods, which were a Simsville feature as well. Number 96. It's safe to say that The Sims has been a ball-busting success. It's had numerous world records in that Guinness Book of them. For instance, the most expansion packs for a video game series, although if you've watched this video, you could have definitely guessed that was coming. Number 97. It also got the record for best-selling PC game series, with an estimated count of 36 to 50 million units. 
As a franchise, it's at number 8 in the top best-selling video game franchises of all time, with 200 million copies sold. Number 98 Something that I suppose helped this along is the fact that The Sims has been made available in 22 languages across 66 countries worldwide, which helps with the big numbers. I wonder if one of those languages is Simlish. <laughs> I'm sorry. Number 99 La Poste, the French postal service, got all nerdy in 2005 and printed 3 million stamps in a limited Heroes of Video Games collection. It featured 10 different stamps, including Mario and Link, but also got two Sims fighting over a plum bob. That's why I even mentioned this in the first place. Number 100! Fans of The Sims are called Simmers. There you go, that's the fact. You're welcome. I mean, it's a bit ridiculous. Who gives their own fan base a name? Hey, motherfa- Oh. Number 101! In 2007, a live-action film based on The Sims was announced. 20th Century Fox have the rights, and Brian Lynch, a man responsible for a lot of the Minions films, was set to write it. But given that it's pretty much over a decade since we heard anything, and the fact is a pretty bad idea, let's not hold our breath on it happening, yeah? Unless Jennifer Lawrence plays Bella Goth. Ah, now I'm interested. So that was 101 Facts About The Sims. What was your favourite Sims game? What was your favourite expansion pack? Have we missed any Sims facts out? Let me know in the comments down below. Also let us know what you want to see in the next 101 Facts instalment. Because we cater to you, my friends. And to you, we want to please. Anyway, look at this. Oh, two videos on screen now, one of which you can click. Go on then. I actually dare you, and I'll see you over there, probably. Unless it's Chris doing it. But it might be me, so we're both good. So go for one of them. Bye!